for staying for the session with these titles, Supercharging the Economy Towards the Danube Tech Valley. My name is Elena Kutko, I'm Director of the Globsec Policy Institute, and I'm going to be moderating this session today. You already heard many times today that the theme of this conference is the recovery, but the recovery that is going to get us to the point that is going to be better than what we had before. And a lot of speakers have agreed that innovation is key. The big question, of course, is how to get there and how to get there quickly. There are a lot of elements that we can discuss in these uh, uh, relations. For example, how to develop and keep talent, how to finance the innovation, and so on. You heard from Prime Minister Heger today, who basically had a plea on this stage early in the morning, and he said, enough words, action, please. So we're going to make it the motto of this session, and we'll try to focus on practical ideas and practical solutions. This is also why Globsec is uh, launching the initiative that we are calling the Danube Tech Valley. The initiative broadly aims to make the region more innovative and that's been endorsed by the Slovak government and the Austrian government. I'll keep you in suspense for a few minutes to explain what it is, but right now I want to introduce the perfect panel to deal with the wide set of questions for today's conversation. We have with us Minister Richard Sulik, who is Deputy Prime Minister of the Slovak Republic and also Minister of Economy. We have Good afternoon. Welcome to the session. We have Wilhelm Molterer, who is Chairman of the Board of Directors, Globsec Vienna. And we have Arkady Dobkin, who is Chief Executive Officer, President and Chairman of the Board, EPAM Systems, based in Philadelphia. Mr. Minister, I'm going to start with you. Can you lead us through your game plan when it comes to making the economy more innovative? What are your priorities that you think are going to deliver the most practical results and preferably the sooner the better? <clears throat> so, once again, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the question. Thank you for this invitation. <clears throat> so, to make it short, the most... Uh, uh, the highest priority which we have on uh, Ministry of Economy is uh, to make better, to make a better entrepreneurship, to make uh, better the environment for companies, for um, people who want to create anything. And uh, this is very difficult because you don't have one big solution. You have hundreds, thousands of small barriers which are making the entrepreneurship uh, difficult, more difficult. And now to put it away, you need hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands small steps. So now, now to your question. Uh, last year uh, we prepared 114 concrete, small, but 114 solutions to make better entrepreneurship and uh, this already passed our national council so this is already uh, valid. For example, any changes in uh, tax laws are valid only to 1st January. This is a small, small change but if you have 114 small changes uh, the world is, the entrepreneur world is, is just better. This year we are continuing and we have uh, 469 small different uh, improvements. It's, it's very, very difficult to collect them, to, to know about this. And uh, so it's, it takes uh, <clears throat> months and uh, a lot of months, but I think we are finished with our work and uh, up until end of this year we can, we can uh, put it in Parliament and uh, hopefully this will also be passed by our National Council. So this is my concrete answer, what we are doing. And let me, let me say uh, one sentence more, we are not making a big difference between innovation or between uh, just normal uh, entrepreneurship. It is not very, very important how we are earning, how the companies are earning the money, 
much more important is that they are earning the money, that they are employing the people. And uh, in this, from this point of view, we are trying to make universal improvements, universal rules for all types of company, com Thank companies. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister, for making it very clear that actually to implement the big dreams and big ideas, you may need to make 1,000 very concrete small steps and do it now. Thank you for that. Arkady, I'm going to go to you next. Um, we are talking about innovation, and of course, in today's world, is the private sector that's at the forefront of innovation. I remember I listened to an interview with you once, and you said that uh, uh, when you were developing your company, you didn't want to be just a normal local company that would work just with local companies. You wanted to be a really good company, and that means being globally competitive. In Central Europe, we also have a lot of discussions how to make sure that we have companies here that are globally competitive. From your business perspective, what do you think Central Europe needs to make sure that there can be successful, globally competitive company that uh, start here and that stay here? <coughs> okay, thank you for the question. I think just a couple of words why my opinion is even relevant when I am from Philadelphia. Uh, <laughs> because I grew up in the Soviet Union 30 years ago, moved to the United States, and the company actually from our almost 50,000 people, uh, more than 40,000 people actually in Central Eastern Europe. So and for the last 25 years I was spending probably half of my time in Europe. This is just for relevance. For, for answering the question, it's, it's much more difficult exercise actually. Because first of all, when we're talking about innovation, and I very much agree with you, it's a very difficult term to define. That's why like innovation or entrepreneurship, I think it's very related and it's, uh, if somebody would be asked to define what's necessary specifically for innovation, there are a lot of words people pronouncing, but they are very, very fuzzy. So, if we're talking about high-tech business in general, which require a lot of entrepreneurs, and hopefully from this there are some different type of innovation would be follow. Uh, 20 years ago when we started, it was just difficult to prove that it's possible to do in Central Eastern Europe because it was so big difference. So today, with what happened in the world during the last 20 years, it's all about talent and availability of the talent. And I think uh, those countries who focus in specifically on this and will be able to transform the educational system quicker and bring this educational system much more closer to practicality and put some leadership in this in different balance. I'm not saying that academy shouldn't lead this, but uh, unfortunately, based on our experience and based on what we discussed, academy very often driving education to the form what they were thinking before how to educate. And technology is changing so fast that it's becoming completely irrelevant. That's why educational system should be changed, should adjust to all technology advances, and uh, some practitioners who actually build in the new system. Like you understand, people who build in Google or build in Amazon platforms, couldn't learn it in university. And if it's transferred to university today, by the time it would be done, these people are not going to be there. So it should be real, real time kind of uh, aggregation. So one more point before I switch. I'm hearing a lot of, and we operate practically in all countries in Central Eastern Europe today. And a lot of government worry about, okay, let's innovate here, let's have headquarters here. Versus uh, we just have smart people which working for somebody else. And I think uh, smart people working for somebody else, that's exactly what should be established, should be quantitated, because then it would be possible to do something different. And it, for small countries, it's a challenge how to do and develop business in this country. It still will be part of the global. And as soon as the clients somewhere in the big markets, then these companies will have to move. 
like all examples about Israel, for example, only confirm in this case. Most of the high tech in, in Israel also moving to America or somewhere else. It's almost impossible to do differently. So, but having right and smart people in the country and keep them and protect them, that's, I think, the main, the main uh, goal we should be, because in this case, it's create different economy. Headquarters is a secondary priority. Thank you so much, Arkady, for outlining a few things, including that the uh, focus on keeping the people and not being obsessed with locations of HQ could be the uh, possible pathway for the region as well. Uh, I just want to encourage the audience to start thinking about the questions that you would like to pose, and please just wave at me at any moment, and I'll remember that you wanted to uh, ask a question. And I'll go now to Wilhelm Molterer. Uh, Wilhelm, I created a little bit of suspense about the Danube Tech Valley that we are trying to develop. Could you please explain to us what it is and why we're doing it? Well, I think we all have consensus that if we want to be competitive and if we want to be resilient, this is the big targets of the European Union, we need innovation by definition. And if you talk about innovation, what comes to, the, to at least to my mind is, do we have the right ecosystem to have a strong innovation capacity and willingness in place? And one of the issues, at least as I see, one of the problems we are facing in this very region here in Central Europe, that everything is done on national level. If you go, for instance, for the recovery and resilience programs, and if you are a company acting in this region, and most of the companies are acting in the region and not in one member state just, they have to go to any single of these programs because all of the programs look different. It's not a surprise, but it's a fact. To create such an ecosystem is the idea behind of this Danube Tech Valley initiative. What do we want to achieve? First of all, we want to be a regional platform for political coordination and cooperation. It means call it P2P. <laughs> Second, we want to be a platform of cooperation and coordination politics and business. Call it P2B. But what we want to be also is to be a coordinating and co a platform uh, of cooperation between businesses, call it B2B. This is the idea behind, a cross-border idea in this very central European region alongside the River Danube. It's an open concept. You can start even with Bavaria or Baden-Württemberg and go down to the Black Sea. That's the, river, that's the idea behind. And what we are considering to start with rather concrete initiatives, because I love your approach to be concrete and have, having results. First, to create a network of universities and research institutions. You would be surprised if you dig into how far away these institutions still are, even if they are regionally quite close. Second, why not to create a network of innovators, accelerators, incubators alongside the River Danube? And if you look into the map, you have strong innovation hubs and centers, but they are not linked. This goes, for instance, in, uh, in regions they go beyond the European Union. Talk about, about Serbia, talk about Belgrade, a very strong hub for innovation. Third, it would be a nice idea also to talk about financing because we have already discussed this afternoon capital market initiatives. They are existing partially, but on national level. We do not have such an entity that goes beyond. What's the result then? We do not have, we, we have trained and educated people, but the companies are leaving because equity is delivered somewhere else and not in this region. Why not to try at least to have this regional cross-border approach. We have, by definition, some businesses, they are, they are already alongside the River Danube. Think about the automotive sector. This is already a cross-border, practically a cross-border project, but it's not really linked. These are ideas simply to create, first of all, an open platform that goes for, as I have said, the, the three different types of cooperation, P, 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 B, B, B. Be open to Europe, 
to European countries, to non-European and be open on topics. I give you just one example, everybody will be surprised because you are talking about IT and the high tech and I'm talking about the low tech end. Do you know that the European Union is importing, I think, 70% or 80% of the needs of soya, beans? Do you know that the river Danube Basin is one of the best regions to produce soya? Why aren't we not putting our forces together to do something together? And this is what we want to achieve, to be concrete, and therefore it's an invitation to all of you. It's an in invitation to governments, please give us advice, what do you need, and specifically also to business. Because we want to be, we wanna be open, but we want to be active as Globesec, offering concrete results. That's the Tech Danube Valley Initiative in short. Thank you so much, Avila. Mr. Minister, you wanted to jump in straight away? Yes, I would like to, <clears throat> I would like to try to answer you why uh, in, the De in the Danube Bazan is not producing, we are not producing soya. I think the reason is that we are producing corn because we can have better profits, for example. So I would not to try to regulate or, or like to some, uh, try to in several countries to make the same and if you have too much regulation, you have lost competitiveness and, and this, sure. is, this is very important. Um, if we allow, I would like a little bit disagree with you. I think it is not a good idea to try to unify the rules in, in several countries. Because now, okay, we are small countries. Uh, Austria is also small, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovakia is a uh, very small country. But we, have, we, have, we are competitors. Mm -hmm. We are competitors not only in, in products and prices, but also in, in the rules which are, uh, which are coming from government. If, the, if people, if the voters are voting uh, a good government which will create smart rules, our country can be better like other countries. Mm -hmm. And this is what is bringing us in, in, in the future and, and which is bringing um, really advantages, this competitiveness. And you would kill the competitiveness with, with uh, your, your ideas. Wow, well, you are... You are, you are, you are uh, do you mind if I actually ask for a business perspective on this matter? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm absolutely proud how important and how strong Globesec is treated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I will start taking questions in a second, but Arkady, do you mind help us uh, resolve this dilemma? <laughs> Listen, everybody has... Uh, own perspective when answering so my perspective will be the country will win as much as the more highly paid jobs exist in the country and more smart people staying in the country mm -hmm. from this point of view that's kind of simple simple statement because like with all corporate profits like headquarters here or headquarters there there is uh, Price transfer in rules and everything else, it's still kind of equalizing. But people staying, and if, for example, in high tech, and it doesn't matter if United States, so it's uh, Slovakia or Belarus or Ukraine, people in high tech today paid probably at least twice or three X on average, mm -hmm. or actually four or five, honestly. Okay. So, which means that it's creating another level of economy. So that's the goal, how to make sure that these people stay in the country. That's, from my point of view, should be key government role. Then if the rules across the combination of countries are similar, I think it's create better conditions to focus how to bring this to the region, like if it's possible to combine, because otherwise you compete with India, you compete with, like, again, I'm oversimplifying everything. But even countries like Poland or Ukraine, will have a little bit more advantage because they are much bigger. Uh, so, and then I don't know, then complexity is beyond my... But thank you so much for this perspective. I'm going to start taking, and what I'm going to do, questions, I'll to take a few questions uh, at a time. I already have four people on my list, so don't worry, I'll get back to, uh, to you, and we'll start uh, with a question here. Thank you very much, Katarina Maternova. Now I deal with countries, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Moldova, and further east. Uh, 
but I spend a big portion of my career on investment climate, business environment, how to make it happen. I think all of the good ideas, how much regulation, uh, networking, the pathetic situation in the human uh, development sector, bad education that we have, all of that's important. But the one thing that, that I boil down in my mind, why there is such a a huge reliance on the banking sector, with the anemic capital markets, with the entrepreneurship, really starved of cash, is boiling down to one issue. And I would like Minister and, and yourself to comment. Is it about attitude to risk? Because there is, a, there is both in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe, for different reasons, fear of failure. Failure, you know, bankruptcy is an embarrassment. Bankruptcy is something that, you know, you failed in life. Whereas when you go to talk to the entrepreneurs from the Silicon Valley, they celebrate failure. Is this something that is on people's minds? Is this something that is really at the essence of, of uh, being able to mobilize the private capital more? Thank you so much, Katerina. Could you please pass the microphone to uh, Mr. Ambassador? Uh, thank you very much, Nigel Baker, British Ambassador um, to Slovakia. Um, the other day, uh, Boris Johnson sort of set out uh, his challenge, in a way, f f for the United Kingdom, which was to create uh, and sustain a high-tech, high-wage, high-productivity economy. And he flagged two particular areas where he thought government should be involved. One was education, uh, and the other was what he calls a leveling up agenda ensuring um, heading off major regional disparities. In the UK's case, it's not all about London, it's about other parts of the country as well. Um, and I, this is in the context, obviously, of global competition, and particularly competition, economic competition from, uh, from Asia. I wondered whether the panel agreed that this is also the right recipe, in a sense, for Central and Eastern Europe for this region, and if so, what the particular challenges and perhaps obstacles to that high-tech, high-wage, high-productivity economy might be here in the region? Thanks. Thank you so much. We'll stick with these uh, two questions for now. And uh, uh, feel free to pick up on any elements that you would like from it. And Willy, I'll go to you first. Well, first of all, I love competition. That's perfect. But the question is, are we really happy to compete amongst each other just? alongside the river, or are we realizing that the real competitors are global? That's the first question. Second, the answer for me is clear. The competition is a different one, because we are competing with Asia, we are competing with the US, we are competing with totally different types. Second question is, for being successful, and I love these ideas that was launched also by, 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 by Boris Johnson, you need to have a critical size. Critical size matters. And as we are all small countries in this region, we do not have the critical size to be successful in the global competition. That's the whole reason behind. And third, I think what you, Kati, had, had mentioned is, is for me key. We should not make an artificial distinction between what's the, polit the political goal and what's the business people's thinking. I think one of the key questions is, are we creating an, an atmosphere of cooperation, also in risk sharing, for instance. Are we really on the right track? And I give you one example from Austria, a country I know best. What is the result of this famous money out of the res uh, resilience and recovery fund? We are not talking about financing any longer, we are talking about public grants, just. Big mistake. If you want to have the private sector on board, invite the private sector for sharing risk with the public sector to do the right investments. And this is for me the reason why we need this partnership approach. And we are not interested in, in establishing rules and regulations. That's not our job. We want, to, we want to support to create exactly this ecosystem of innovation and, partner and partnering. And I said, we are way too small to compete with uh, the big ones. We need the critical mass in this very central European region also to play a role within the European Union as such. Mr. Minister. I am very sorry. I have to disagree. I, I have to disagree. Second, 
time. I don't think that we need a critical size uh, like dinosaurs uh, oh. thousands of years ago that had also a critical size. Which critical size had uh, Tesla on beginning? Elon Musk is a one-man show. Where is the critical size of Gutenberg 500 years ago? Or where was the critical size of McDonald's? It's the biggest company in, in uh, uh, gastronomy perhaps today. I, I, don't, I don't think that this is the right concept with a critical size. And second, uh, I would like to react to Katarina. <laughs> Hello. Um, it's very important, I agree also with you, to have public, uh, sorry, to have private money, private financing. It's, it's, a, it's a wrong mantra to think that without public money we will not have innovation. I don't think that uh, uh, Facebook, Google, or hundreds, thousands other companies had public money to start with a zero and to make a big result. Okay, which, which public money had Facebook? The military sector was the driver for IT development. Facebook? Facebook is Steve making Jobs. use of it. Steve oh. Jobs. They make use of it. Steve Jobs had uh, public money, uh, military sector. No, I said they make use of it. But public money was at the starting point also. I'm not fi fighting for public money. I'm fighting for private money. Yes. What I think uh, what is really <laughs> important. Okay, <laughs> last, to, last sentence, yeah. please. Really important is to create to create smart rules mm -hmm. from, from the governmental Absolutely. side. Absolutely. And, and then, okay, we have competition, and please, uh, dear companies, fight. Mm -hmm. Fight also here, ag one against the second, not all companies against China. This will not work, I am afraid. Mr. Minister, can I also ask you to answer Ambassador's question about whether you agree that the education and the uh, origi uh, com eliminate the regional disparity is also the right path for Slovakia to go forward? Yes, I think in this question we all will agree education is a crucial point and this is also an area where, where state, where government can be very active, can, can uh, reach good, strong results and unfortunately, I have to say, the education in Slovakia is an area where uh, it's a lot of space for improvements. A lot of space. I, I use this formulation. <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably not your ministry. Uh, thank you so much for that. Arkady, I'll move to you. And uh, I know that uh, uh, Katarina's questions about the culture of taking risk has not been answered. So if you want to chip in on that. Cal culture, culture of taking risk and the fear of risk in the reason. Um. <laughs> so I think... Uh, I think it's a little bit overrated because Silicon Valley exists when entrepreneurs very often not taking a risk of their own money. Entrepreneurs taking risk of private equity money. So basically the risk not on their side. In this situation in startup risk on private equity side. So and uh, I think that's true, but it's very, very specific ecosystem of Silicon Valley, which is very difficult to replicate in short period of time. So it will take really good time before number of significant number, impactful number of this type of private equity would be organized somewhere in some specific region. Okay, so that's my point. But it's not about so much entrepreneurs. What, what you were saying that probably entrepreneurs have less opportunities because there is no this system to, to try. Still, difficult for me to comment. I'm coming a little bit from different technology background and uh, not sure that this is the primary, primary problem. I, I would like to repeat still, like when we're talking about different countries, companies in the country, that Again, the, main, the, the only possible measurement is people in the country who are doing difficult, high-tech, intellectual job. Because as soon as a company is successful, 
companies stop thinking, most of them stop thinking about them as a U.S. company or German company, they become a really international company. In the whole innovation ecosystem, this is kind of the uh, fun, fun, fundament for this, for this creation. Like, think the, uh, the most famous high-tech company in Europe, let's say SAP. Okay. In the world, nobody thinking about SAP as a German company. And it's not a German company anymore. They have huge presence everywhere. But the whole point, how many people still doing software in Waldorf and uh, other, other locations there. And I, I agree with you that some rules like should be created a better balance across number of small companies. Okay. Because it would be easier to operate for those companies which would grow and create jobs. Otherwise, like us, 70% of my job going through one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction, having like hundreds of managing directors, while for the, com for the country the benefit would be if we would have thousands of good engineers in the country and do it quickly. From this point of view, I think it might might make sense to establish the rule. It's not about investment so much as well, because like as soon as you find in these rules and simplify infrastructure, think about it. In US, you open one country, operate it in 50 states. Mm. In Ukraine, you create one country, operate across 35 million people. And in Czech Republic, in Slovenia, in Slovakia, in Croatia, in Montenegro, and whatever. That's a real headache. Um. May I please short? Uh, one sentence, if possible. Oh, okay. I try. No, I, try. I understand and I, I agree with you. It's very difficult in, to, in every then, country to no, have an other legislation. And this small country never going to win, period. Okay, but, but uh, for example, tax law. Uh, the Slovakian tax law has nearly 50,000 words. All, all taxes, uh, no, no, income tax law, okay. And Austrian has 17 or 100,000, I don't know. But if we would, if we would uh, let it make European Union, it would be, have 500,000 laws and it, it would be much more complicated. I am, I am afraid of this. It would be much more complicated if we would let, down, let do this European Union or some, some higher authority. I, I cannot imagine how we should have a common tax law in 10 countries. This is not possible. No, no uh, uh, taxation without representations. We, okay, we, we, right. we, can think, we, can... we can think about this to end, but this means to join to one country, like USA. I think is, is, is the willingness for this is not given here in Europe. Yeah, Richard, I like... Uh... Listen, I'm yeah, we, will, we can discuss yeah. this issue a little bit later because okay. there are a lot of people who are uh, queuing up to have questions. I have three people on my list. Uh, I have a, a question over there uh, and then uh, here and here. And I remember you, everybody. Thank you very much, Anton Spisak. I'm a head of economic policy at the Tony Blair Institute. I work in London. I have this iPhone in my hand, which not many people know that actually Steve Jobs maybe didn't benefit from public money, but. Uh, a lot of the technologies behind iPhone were financed by almost entirely by public finances Indeed. throughout the 50s, 70s, 60s and 70s in the US. And not just that, if we talk about Elon Musk, he has actually taken huge, huge public investments Absolutely. and loans from the US government. That's just a side note. But I think the serious point I wanted to make is that there is a huge, huge market failure in this region when it comes to innovation. The average EU 27 spending on R&D, and that includes public and private, is around 2%. In Slovakia, it's 0.8%. 0.8% of R&D, public and private, goes to finance research and development. It's astonishingly small. There is a huge market failure. And to think that entrepreneurship support alone will resolve this failure without active industrial policy without active innovation policy, without serious public commitment to spending money, is completely nonsensical. And this is Economics 101. Market failures, basic R&D is really, really important. And I, I, I cannot believe I have to say this, uh, but it is actually <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> true. 
<laughs> we get the point. Thank you so much. We'll get back on the market failover <laughs> versus regulation. And I'll take two more questions. One question over here and uh, Roland over there. Um, again, uh, from Slovakia, uh, Daniel Aktachium. Uh, it will be for Arkady and, and generally, uh, you know, we are semiconductor company, we do also software. And what I see, uh, you know, kind of first stepping stone on uh, worldwide competition is effectively contracting, you know. Uh, and contracting, I would guess that probably produces $200,000 per head, quarter million per head revenue roughly. At least, in, in, at least based on India numbers, less than quarter million. Now, the next step is product companies. For example, NVIDIA is one and a half to two million dollars per head, per, per person. And the question is, uh, how or when, basically in our region, we can transition or created environment that we can have just service company but move to product companies. Thank you so much and I'll take one more question. Thank you. Roland Freudenstein, Vice President of Globsec. And let me just throw in another idea here to, to, the, to the many. Estonia. <coughs> you know, when I think tech and a sorry about the term, formerly communist country, or a central East European country. Estonia comes to mind. But by the magazine Wired, it was named the most advanced digital society in the world. Among other things, because they have e-government. Government services are 99% uh, uh, online. And, and, and here's another point where I, I don't want to gang up against Minister Sulik here, but there's another point where government comes in and can play in a, a crucial role. It's not only education, it's not only R&D, it is e-government as a catalyst for the digitalization of society. And it's just my little point here. Thank, Thank you so much. So we have three questions. The uh, market failure on innovation, how to create the product companies and not just service companies, and the e-governance as the catalyst of innovation. Mr. Minister, would you like to go first? Um, no. Perfect. <laughs> uh, then we're going to go to Arkady. <laughs> uh, like, very, very, very simple. This is like uh, huge questions which you're asking about, again, services company, which is e-commerce, versus product companies, which is... Uh, and the answer, and specifically when and you're using like whatever, 200 per head or 50 per head or 2 million per head, first of all, that's huge oversimplification of everything because product company might have 10 people and spend 90% of their revenue on marketing. So that's why dividing by people, it's so artificial metric. And there are a huge number of product companies which are losing money and have huge revenue per person and losing money because spending more on efforts to sell something which is not sellable. So, versus in today world, there is no black and white. It's like kind of in the middle. In enterprise world, in government world, like any product today, it's like 20, 30 maximum portion of the solution. There are so many classical product software in enterprise sitting on the shelves unused and spent a lot of government money that it's like impossible to talk about. That's why it's not about, again, for me it's simple metric. Number of jobs created in the country, high paid and loyalty of the people to stay in the country. That's what matters. Everything else, it's bad sign of bad politics, playing product versus service or whatever. So this is, uh, again, that's my opinion. On e-government, I don't know, like I'm not an expert at all in this area. In the first one, I'm pretty conf confident. And uh, Estonia is a great example. The only problem is that uh, it's a very, very small country and it's very, very kind of relatively easy to do. So as soon as you go in and start to compare this with something more sophisticated, it's much more difficult. But that's a, 
good goal, but also I don't know exactly like that, that should be done. The problem is that Estonia or Singapore or maybe a couple other examples where or country very small or sorry democracy is, is very weak. And then you do in all of this. So and successfully. Otherwise it's becoming very, very difficult. Thank you so much, Arkady. Willy, I'll go next to you then. Uh, just two, two, two ideas for food for thoughts. Why I think it's important that this regional cooperation. In Europe, we are talking about capital market union, which simply does not exist. We are talking about it. It's not existing. Why not to start an initiative from this region to create at least something on regional? Because if you go for a private investor coming from abroad and asking whether you're interested to go there for private equity, and as I've told you beforehand, the, the answer is you need 27 lawyers if you want to make something, or in this region you need at least 15 or 20 lawyers. Why not give it a try? i give you a second example. We are talking about green transition. I want to have an energy. I want to have a discussion. Where do we achieve the cheapest possibility for green energy transition? The cheapest. Because this is one extremely important uh, basis for, for, for business. Are we talking about the most efficient solution here in this region? We are not. Whereas the energy markets are interlinked with the interconnectors, better or worse, it's, it's an issue. And the economy is so strongly linked in this region. We should give this, not just a try, for me it's a simple need. RDI, last example, is it really necessary that every, everybody is doing the same on basic research? No. Shouldn't we share our, our capacities and our knowledge? and make a really strategic discussion about the question who is doing what and sharing the experience. We are not rich enough. But if we join forces, we can achieve more. That's the whole idea behind. Yes. Mr. Minister, uh, no. Basic R&D is one very good example where it makes really sense to connect uh, to, to come together to join uh, our forces and, and uh, um, enforcement. So, okay, basic R&D. Slovak state is, Slovak government is already financing basic R&D in universities or we have Slovak Academy of Science. I suppose Slovak Academy of Science is working of Austrian, is working together uh, and coordinating themselves with other Academy of Sciences in other countries. I suppose, I don't know, but this makes, uh, this makes sense, okay. But I, I think it's, it's a really mistake to try to put all together, try to unify, because as I told on the beginning, we will lose this competitiveness. And uh, my answer to the yeah, to young men there, uh, I'm part of the government. I have a lot of information, I have access to a lot of information, and we should not forget the money which we'll, which we'll want to use for uh, supporting innovations and so far. The money is not falling from the heaven. The money has to earn people and they are paying it in taxes. We have uh, some special, special case with money from European Union. This seems like to be fallen from the heaven, from our point of view. Okay, we are using this money like other countries, but, for example, I don't know about one successful IT project financed by the government in Slovakia. I don't know. But I know a lot of pro uh, IT projects coming from, from the private sector and not financed uh, by, by the public money. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go back to the questions. I saw there was a question here. Do you want, do you want to please go ahead with a question? And uh, please keep raising your hands if there are more interest in the audience as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrei Stanchik, uh, I'm a member of parliament, uh, of coalition. 
Um, my question is, there was a question about the public funding on, on investments and uh, um, innovations. And for me, the, the basic question is that we are competing in a global market, as was said, and even if we don't, uh, let's say, support emerging technologies, China will do it, or the US will do it. So uh, I'm kind of on the stronger together side, but my question is how can we uh, compete with such a giant as China or the United States, and on the one hand, to support new emerging technologies, when they are starting on the S-curve, because we need to do that simply, but on the other hand to prevent zombification, just to pay them with public money and uh, keep them alive on the expense of taxpayer, and if, if they are not effective, then, then they will fa fail anyway. So that's my question, like how to set the support of public funds in order to compete, but not to make it basically useless and just dependent on taxpayers' money. Thank you so much. I think there was a question over there. Are you... S yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as Mr. Sulik said, the dinosaurs are not competitive or something like that. He's right, but it does, it's, uh, for my opinion, not a question of the size of companies. It's the size of the critical mass of markets. Indeed. Uh, I need a big market and uh, IT business, for example, that a small company has a market to grow. And that, I think, is very much important. That is the uh, advantage. That is the advantage of, uh, thank you, the advantage of the United States or, you know, or China towards Europe because we have no digital market set until now and we have not done a capital market together to get venture capital. Those are the two mistakes. And therefore, I have some sympathy with uh, Willy Motra has said, so long we are not able to do it fully on the European level, do it on a smaller level in order to be better. It's always better as just one country does it. It would be progress and better chances. Thank you so much. And since it's the last round, I will take uh, two more questions over here and it will be the last questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Denis Tzader from the Zhilina. I'm the member of the regional parliament. I would like to ask a question to the Prime Minister of uh, Mr. Sulik, uh, former Prime Minister and uh, Minister of... Uh, we would like to ask you as a people from the region how you would like to task the, the problem with energy. Let's say how will the government and you as well um, would like to help the people because you know the Orova region, other regions, they are struggling, they are, the people are aware and the awareness of the, of the government steps in the future with the energy uh, and as well if you are in any other cooperation with other ministers, other, other persons from the V4 group for example, from the Europe, how you would like to personally move on and help these people and also the, the, the companies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and the last question from the lady behind you. Thank you very much. Martina Legal Malakova, a coordinatrice of the Gaia X uh, Hub Slovakia and also Industry Innovation Cluster. I have two questions. Uh, I think that uh, it is really important that, uh, to know that also competitors today cooperate together. For example, it is the project uh, based on Gaia X. It is a Catena X project, which is really for the for the automobile sectors, and it is led by BMW and by Volkswagen. So the, today the situation is that we need to cooperate together. So this is the reason why to cooperate in a European level is really important for us. So I think if we will not be as a companies, also as an automobile country, to be involved in such big projects as Gaia X, Catena X, Europro Gigant is, it, is very, it could be very difficult for our companies and for our SMEs. And, um, Second question is that, for example, I understand your business view. I am a businesswoman also. I have my own SME. And uh, 
if other countries use or other companies use, for example, the euro funds or the, the public money for innovation, for investing, for data economy, we couldn't forget data economy. It is not only about innovation, it is almost about data economy and data industrial economy, and we are industrial country. So if, you, if, if we will not, as Slovakia, don't use this public money and the other countries will use, if we will not decrease our competitiveness of Slovakia. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a set of questions. Uh, please, it will be your last chance to make remarks, so try to say everything you want to say. So we had the questions about how to finance uh, what needs to be financing but not to finance zombies, Competi cooperation of competitors, uh, smart public financing, taking into consideration that others are doing it as well. Mr. Minister, you can start. Okay, thanks. I will start with the lady. Yes, this is a very difficult question. What, what we can do or which possibilities we have if other countries, which we, which we are competing with them, are using public money for a lot of projects. The answer is we have to do the same. In this difficult and wrong situation, okay, we have, and, and we are using public money just to be uh, competitive with other countries. But this is not changing my opinion that this is the wrong way. What the governments should do is to create smart rules. We are living in an overruled world. We have rules for completely all the things in this world, and I think this is not necessary. We should have less, much less uh, rules and uh, much smarter rules. This is my opinion, but yes, we have to do the same like other countries. Then was a question about the energy, energy but before uh, I would answer, like to answer Mr. Stanchik, how we can compete with China, for example. So <clears throat> I think not with public money. This is not the, I know China is using a lot of public money, but uh, look, we are also using a lot of public money and have a look on the industrial production in Europe. It's going down. This is a good development, so we should, we should really try to think in a new way, to think out of the box, feel like, uh, for example, because this is not the right way. We don't have the results. We, may, we are making a lot of conferences about how to, uh, how to support innovations, but it's not working. We want, I agree, uh, Mr. Brock, with, uh, with a unique market. It is a good idea to have a unique market, to have a big market. But we should really, we should try to have a big competition between countries, between governments, which are fighting with better or wronger rules. And now about energy is a little bit uh, other issue, so I will be very short. Uh, we have, uh, we, we spent a lot of time uh, in the last two weeks uh, just uh, about because the prices are going, home, uh, going very high. I think the reason is uh, one uh, very strong uh, Nachfrage. <laughs> demand. demand. Demand, oh yes. So we have very strong demand. After, after the corona crisis, the economy is coming back, so it's very strong demand. And the second is a conflict uh, belong, regarding the Nord Stream 2. And I suppose in the next uh, three, four months, uh, over the winter, the situation will be better again. And more, uh, the situation will, be, will, will stabilize. Especially in Slovakia, we are, we are in a good situation with uh, households, with the people. The SPP, the Slovak gas company, has enough contracts to deliver to good prices for the wall next year. So the prices will come back to, to the year 2020. If you, if you have a look on the development of gas prices, it's, it's like so, and last, and, and this year, 21, it, it is coming strong, uh, it is a strong decrease and we will come back. So next year we will have similar prices like last year. And electricity is a situation, thanks to our nuclear power plants. Uh, it's also, I think, we have good messages. We, okay, we will have a price increase, but it's not so high. It's perhaps 
15% it make 3 or 4 euro for an average household per month, 3 or 4 euro, euros, and the minimum salary increased by 23, average salary increased by 60 or 70 euro, euros uh, per month, and prices on electricity, for electricity will increase by 3 or 4. So I think this is not a dramatic uh, situation, and Slovak Republic has, uh, uh, is in a really good situation thanks to our nuclear plants. And last remark, I cannot until today understand why Germany is taking uh, the nuclear power, power plants taking away from the net. I, I don't understand this. It's a very wrong de decision. Okay. Thank you so much, Thanks. Mr. Minister. Uh, Arkady, I'll go back to you and very tempted to ask you whether you are worried about your competitors using public money. What I am worried about my competitors with the public money? Whether you are worried that competitors are receiving the public money and hence you are at a disadvantage if you don't receive public money? Uh, listen, in different geographies we were receiving public money as well, not directly but some through special incentives. So, and I think if it would be done on not exclusion basis. We shouldn't worry about it. We need like, to see how to put this in good, uh, good direction for ourselves as well. So, but again, the whole point, that it's, whole point, the public money should be directed to the real opportunity, not just given. So I think in uh, several jurisdictions where we were getting incentives, it did work exactly this way. And in IT world, and again, that's my area of the experience. So like India did a great job and there are huge innovation industry in India because for 30 years they were building this through very simple initially jobs and then accumulated enough experience to create some type of capital market structure and innovation structure, while they still have image like low-level low, low coding, there is good portion of this, the size of many countries, which is really innovative driven. So if that would be put for this type of goal, so we will be part of the beneficial as well, but return should be much bigger. And I think in all countries where we where using this return was very good for the countries. Thank you so much, and Willy, you have the last word. A couple of remarks very briefly. One of the issues uh, <coughs> that Europe, and specifically also this region, is facing, that we are doing not so bad anymore on the VC side. That means the venture capital market is developing in the right direction. The gap is now existing on the private equity to finance scaling and growing companies. And if this is not closed, this gap, these companies will leave this region and therefore will lose jobs. And this is the reason why I think this critical mass for a capital market is needed in this region to really attract private investors to go into this type of, of investment to keep innovation and keep companies and keep jobs there. Second, I'm absolutely absolutely skeptical or not skeptical, I'm, 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 I'm extremely scared if and when we start a discussion fighting public and fighting private. It's way more about blending public and private. What happened, and I've just make one sentence what I have done the last five years. We were using public money to offer a guarantee, attracting five, I, the, 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 the guarantee was 30 billion, and we incentivized 500 billion investment via EAB, where I was working for. And the difference between the 30 and the 500 is private money. And what was the result? Via the guarantee, we had a clear policy target, and via private money, we had the highest level of efficiency because the money is to be paid back. It's not a grant, it's financing. And the private sector gives exactly the right incentives, creating a critical mass and giving the right uh, incentive. Third, and I'm also scared about uh, listening to the, the, the artificial 
let's say, dividing world between cooperation and competition. I give you just one example. Last week in Vienna, we had a wonderful conference on autonomous driving. 170 global companies were sitting around and there. And they have created a new word, and that's called co-opetition. We need competition, but we need cooperation at the same time. And I think this new, this, 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 I love the word, co-opetition, because this really brings us forward, not to fight each other, but to put the forces together. And last but not least, I find this is a classical example, Globsec as its best. To offer exactly this platform of discussion between public and private sector to bring both of us a step, a step further. Thank you so much, Willy. Thank you so much uh, to all the speakers and to all the participants for the fantastic panel. We learned new words, co-petition. We had some arguments about the matter of size, how much is good and how much is not good and in which areas. We all agree that education and investing into talent is the key and priority for everybody. We will keep working on this topic in the future and we will be delighted to have you back with us on further occasions. I need to make a few technical announcements. In about eight minutes, we're going to start our focus groups. There is going to be four focus groups. Most of them are downstairs, and there is one on this floor in Kriven Room. So please uh, follow the instructions that you received in the invitations. Another announcement, after that, there will be three separate dinners. So please check the invitations, uh, and they will indicate which dinners you are attending. There will be buses organized for the dinners that are not in this hotel. And after that, we're looking forward to seeing you at the cocktail party at 10 p.m. Thank you so much, everybody, and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.